morning, everyone. Welcome to Paulsburg Community Church. My name is Stephen, one of the leaders here. Hey, we're super excited to be with you today. Will you join us? Let's stand together right now. We're going to worship Jesus. Let's do it. Here we go. One, two, one, two, here we go. God is a father to us, someone who rescues us. I was an orphan lost at the fall, running away when I heard you call. Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. Father, you love me still. And in love before you you predestined to adopt me as your own thank you lord you have raised me up so high above my station i'm a child of god by grace and grace alone Worship Jesus today for his humility. He left it all to serve. You left your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cost. Jesus, your face was set. I worked my fingers down to the bone. Nothing I did could ever atone. Jesus, you paid my debt. By your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown And you rose that I might be a new creation I am born again by grace and grace alone I was in darkness I was in darkness all of my life I never knew the day from the night Spirit you made me see I swear I knew the way on my own Heaven of rocks and heart made of stone Spirit you moved in me At your touch my sleeping spirit was awake from 
promises are yes and amen. And all your promises are yes and amen. Let's submit our lives to Him today. thank you for your mercy. Jesus, thank you for going before us. You're our big brother. You're the way. You're the one who went first. You're the firstborn of this new creation, the church. God, we believe in you. We ask that you would lead us today to, to follow you in wisdom and in humility. God, we are broken people made whole because of you. We submit to your leadership and your will. Be with us, Lord. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Can we praise God one last time this morning? Thank you for being here today. Thank you for worshiping Jesus. Hey, we're going to transition right now. You guys can have a seat. and We'll move some stuff around. We'll come right back.
Good morning. Hello. We are so glad that you guys are here with us this morning. My name is Elle, and this is my friend Elizabeth. And we have some fun stuff coming up. Uh, first of all, just a reminder, we still have some Operation Christmas Child boxes. There we go. Um, back there. And if you want to grab one, they are due to drop off tomorrow. So you still have time if you want to grab one of those guys. Um, also, this Wednesday, we at 12 p.m., we are having our Thanksgiving service online releasing. So you can hop online and watch that either Thanksgiving Eve or on Thanksgiving, which is super exciting. Just a time to kind of remember why we are thankful uh, to center ourselves on Christ um, and hear some really awesome testimonies from people who are a part of Paulsville Community Church. Um, so please join us online for that um, from Wednesday at 12 p.m. Um, on. It's going to be great. L, you didn't say anything about that. <laughs> I you love, love your hat you love so okay. much. Are you like 100% ready at your house for Christmas? We are not. Not yet. Well, as you can see, I am 100% ready. So, including my 25-day calendar treat for my cat Phineas. <laughs> He's absolutely in love. He's ready. He's that ready. is amazing. <laughs> well, but what that means is that I'm ready to be here next week as we ready our building for the Christmas season. And yes, we love the lights and we love the trees, um, but the reason why we ready our building is because um, it reminds us of the hope of the season. It reminds us that we as PCC can be a light to our community in this very dark time. So if you want to join us next week, we would love your help to get the building ready for Christmas. Um, specifically next Sunday after the 11 o'clock service, I'm going to need help bringing down boxes and trees from the loft. So lots of lifting and stairs and things of that nature. So we would love your help. And if you would love to help, you can connect with myself or you can connect with Abby at abby at paulsbocc.com and she'll send you the schedule. But um, if you haven't been in the building, maybe this is a great way to ease back in, have some holiday cheer uh, with the rest of us and set up the building for Christmas. So would you consider joining us? I would really greatly appreciate it. So um, we're so excited, as Elle said, that you're here this morning, whether you're online with us or here in the building. If you're online, please click on the description box below. And there's a couple of links. There's a giving link. There's also our connect card and also the study guide for today. If you're here in the building, you'll find all of those things on your chair. So go ahead and grab your study guide because we're going to jump right into Jonah. In honor of the recent passing of Jeopardy! host Alex Trebek, I thought we'd start this last study of the book of Jonah with a little Jeopardy. The category is Jonah. Remember to phrase your answer in the form of a question. These questions are hard enough that we'll make this the double Jeopardy round. Jonah for 200. It's what the captain discovered Jonah doing during the storm at sea on board the ship to Tarshish. What is? What is sleeping? Jonah for 400. Inside the belly of the great fish, Jonah expressed confidence that he would worship again 
at this Jerusalem-based structure. What is? What is the temple of the Lord? Jonah for 600, Alex. In Jonah chapter 3, the king of Nineveh sat in these as a sign of his repentance. What are? Ashes. Jonah for 800. After the plant providing shade for Jonah is attacked by a worm so that it withers and dies, Jonah prayed that he might do this. What is? What is die? To die. Jonah prayed to die. And Jonah for 1,000. And oh wow, it is the daily double. Let's wager all of it, Alex. A true daily double. At the end of the book of Jonah, the Lord describes the Ninevites as a people who do not know their this from their that. What is their? Their right hand from their left. How'd you do? Did you get them all? Did you run the category, getting all the questions right? Jonah chapter 4 is a chapter full of questions, with the Lord asking Jonah, not telling Jonah. Jonah. Questions about the condition of Jonah's heart. The heading on your study handout, Jonah chapter 4, the Lord questions Jonah. Good morning, church. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, first-time guests and returning guests. Welcome, those of you watching online. Welcome, everyone here in our building. My name is Lincoln, and I am sad. I am sad that this is our last study of the book of Jonah, Jonah the runaway prophet. This morning we are taking our second pass through Jonah chapter 4. In Jonah chapter 4 we get to listen in on a conversation between Jonah and the Lord. What strikes us about this conversation is that Jonah is doing a lot of telling in contrast to the Lord who's doing a lot of asking. So let's launch our study of Jonah chapter 4 with these three uh, quick practical applications about asking instead of telling. Uh, business leaders talk a lot about the art of asking questions, and it's an art that's valuable in all of our personal relationships. Let's find the text in Jonah chapter 4, the different places. The Lord poses a question to Jonah. There are three of them. Mark them in your Bible or highlight them in your Bible app, starting with Jonah chapter 4, verse 4. Jonah 4, 4. Do you see the question there? And the Lord said, Jonah, do you do well to be angry? In fact, Jonah is angry, angry because the Lord has been gracious and merciful to the Ninevites, longtime enemies of Jonah's people, the Israelites. When God forgives a repentant and believing Nineveh so God doesn't destroy the city of Nineveh for their evil ways, Jonah is angry, angry enough to insist that the Lord end Jonah's life. Oh, Lord, it is better for me to die than to live. And that's when the Lord asked Jonah for the first time, Jonah, do you do well, Jonah, to be angry? The next question the Lord has for Jonah comes in verse 9. Would you look for verse 9 and the question there? In Jonah 4, 9, the Lord asked Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? This is the plant that had shaded Jonah from the sun, giving him comfort until the Lord, remember, sent a worm to attack the plant, and then the Lord sent a hot wind that caused Jonah to become faint. So Jonah was ticked again, insisting again that the Lord take his life. It is better for me to die than to live. Really, Jonah, really, do you do well to be angry for the plant? The last question comes at the end of the chapter, Jonah 4.11. It's actually the last verse of the entire book, Jonah 4.11. It's 
It's the Lord asking Jonah, And should not I, the Lord, pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Don't forget all those cattle. It would be a mistake to forget all those cattle. That's like two puns in one, right? Mistake. Thinking about how Jonah chapter 4 seems to come together around these questions questions, these three questions, it got me asking the question, why does the Lord ask and not just tell? The Lord asked Jonah if he does right to be angry instead of telling Jonah, Jonah, stop being such a jerk. You welcome God's blessings into your own life, but you begrudge God's blessings that they're poured into the lives of others. Jonah, you're being a self-centered fool. Knock it off. But that's not what the Lord tells Jonah. In fact, the Lord doesn't tell, he asks. And here's the application for us in our relationship with others. The value of asking questions, good questions. On your handout, the first one. When we ask instead of tell, we can, we can diffuse hostility. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The same can be said of a soft question. A soft question. It can diffuse a hostile conversation. It, it forces a person to engage with their mind along with their emotions. The Lord doesn't ask Jonah, Jonah, are you angry? The Lord asks Jonah, why he's angry. With that simple question, the Lord forces Jonah to slow down and to evaluate his emotional response, to acknowledge his anger, and then to consider if his anger is justified. The Lord's goal isn't just to inform Jonah, hey, Jonah, you're angry. The Lord's goal isn't to inform, but rather to transform Jonah's anger into clear thinking and personal insight. Jonah, do you do well to be angry? Jonah, is your anger helping you? Will your anger get you to that place that you want to be? When we ask instead of tell in our conversations with others, often we connect with a person without setting them off. Our questions can cause the person in front of us to think, not just reacts. We, we hopefully can lower the emotional temperature in the room. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes we can prevent a discussion from becoming overheated, diffuse the hostility that already exists, or at the very least not add more fuel to the fire. When we ask instead of tell, we can diffuse hostility. When we ask instead of tell, we can inspire thoughtfulness. Parents, maybe you've had this experience. Your child comes home with a grade on his or her report card that you're not happy about. Of course, it's never happened in my home, but, but maybe it's happened in yours. And instead of going ballistic, instead, what are some questions you could ask that child? Is this a grade you're happy with? Why do you think you got this grade? What changes could you make to achieve a better grade? How can we help you with that? When we ask instead of tell, we allow that other person to connect the dots. Good questions can focus a person on the most important issues and help us see to the heart of a matter. When we ask instead of tell, we invite ownership, we spur on discovery, we may expose false assumptions. We can unleash creativity and cooperation. So when the Lord asks the question, should not I, the Lord, pity Nineveh? That's the Lord engaging Jonah, inviting Jonah to evaluate Jonah's own attitude toward the Ninevites. If Jonah's Lord is right to show pity to those in need, should not Jonah pity the Ninevites as well? 
You see, when we ask instead of tell, we can inspire thoughtfulness. And this third one, when we ask instead of tell, we can build relationship. Why don't we ask more questions? Why is our natural default, my natural default, to tell and not to ask? Maybe it's our arrogance. We are more impressed with our own answers than we are interested in the ideas of others. Or maybe it's apathy. You simply don't care what the other person thinks. Neither arrogance nor apathy will help us to build better relationships. When we ask instead of tell, we are saying, we care about the person in front of us. You're valuable to me. I have faith in you to become better than you are. The Lord's questions for Jonah were all about deepening Jonah's relationship with the Lord and the Lord helping Jonah to become this more compassionate, sympathetic person that God intended him to be. When we ask instead of tell, we can build relationships. So the challenge this week is to increase the number of times that we ask instead of tell. It's a good challenge because, believe me, it is harder to ask than to tell. I know it too well. I tell a lot more than I ask. And, of course, you will continue to tell, continue to inform, continue to instruct. You're not going to phrase everything in the form of a question so that you're a walking Jeopardy contestant. That would be kind of obnoxious and, and not helpful. But it's something here in Jonah chapter 4 that the Lord models for us in his interactions with Jonah that there is a time to ask and a time to tell, a time to speak and a time to listen. So let's work on it. I'm going to work on it. Now we will read and break out Jonah chapter 4. If you're not there already, find chapter 4 in the book of Jonah in your text starting with verse 1, a little context. Jonah chapter 3 ends with God showing pity to the now repentant and believing Ninevites, so the Lord does not destroy Nineveh. Yet Jonah's reaction is not what it should be. Breaking out Jonah chapter 4, Jonah despairs over the survival of Nineveh. Let's read it. Jonah 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? The Lord asked. But Jonah doesn't answer, not here. Instead, Jonah sets up camp outside the city of Nineveh, and he pouts. And that leads to the Lord's object lesson for Jonah with that plant. Verse 5. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. On your handout, Jonah despairs over the demise of the plant. To say that Jonah is in a state of emotional upheaval is an understatement. 
Jonah's angry about Nineveh. Really angry. And then Jonah's ecstatic about the plant. Exceedingly happy. But now the plant is dead. And Jonah's back to angry. Really angry. Verse 9. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. In other words, Jonah's investment in the plant is zilch. On your handout, Jonah's investment in this short-lived plant is zilch. Jonah, you're upset about the death of this plant. You pity the plant, which is here today and gone tomorrow. Jonah, you enjoyed the plant, but you didn't have any investment in the plant, none at all. No investment in the plant compared to all the investment that the Lord had in the Ninevites and in the city of Nineveh. Verse 11. It's the last verse in the book. It's the Lord speaking. He's, not, he, he, he's asking, not telling. This is the Lord saying, And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Moose day. It's a great one. Uh, the Lord's questions Jonah. Is my pity for Jonah, for Nineveh, is my pity for, no, for Nineveh justified? It's a question that begs the answer, yes. Of course the Lord's pity for Nineveh is justified. And more than that, Jonah's pity for Nineveh. My pity for lost and needy people is not only expected, but it's insisted upon by the Lord. Our God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and not wanting anyone to perish. And that's the target for us. In Jesus Christ, we are putting on more and more of these godly attributes. These are personal qualities that should shine brighter and brighter in our relationships with others. On your handout, the book of Jonah, take two. Let's zoom in now on what Jonah says about these personal attributes of God in Jonah chapter 4, verse 3, and let's clarify what they involve. First one, God is gracious and merciful. Listen now, God's grace and mercy are expressions of his goodness. God's grace is his goodness towards those who deserve only punishment. And God's mercy is his goodness towards those who are in distress. Both these attributes identify the spiritual state of Nineveh, really of all of us. Because of our fallen nature, because of our sin, we are in distress and we deserve only punishment. But God is gracious and merciful toward us. And God calls us to be gracious and merciful toward others. We are to imitate God's grace to others, treating them not as they deserve, but always returning good, even returning good for evil. We imitate God's mercy when we show kindness towards uh, those in distress, like the Lord has shown mercy to us, we turn around, right, and we show mercy to others. On your handout, God is slow to anger. This is the attribute of God's patience. God's patience means God's goodness in withholding punishment toward those who sin over a period of time. The Old Testament frequently speaks of God as slow to anger. In the New Testament, it's spoken of God being kind and forbearing and patient. 
if we're honest, we will all agree we have all been beneficiaries of God's patience. And we see God being patient with almost every main character in the Bible. We also are to imitate God's patience and be slow to anger. The Bible says we are to lead a life with patience. And patience is listed among the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Patience doesn't come easy. Patience has to come from the Lord, and it requires our moment-by-moment trust in God to fulfill His promises and purposes in His chosen time. On your handout. God is abounding in steadfast love. God's love means that God eternally gives himself to others. Love is the giving of self in order to bring blessing and good for others. The Bible says God is love. And we see evidence of that attribute all through the Bible. Love characterizes God's relationship to mankind, especially to sinful men. God shows his love for us in this, that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. The Bible says that God has set his love on us. It is a purpose of all three persons of God to bring us true joy and happiness through loving us. We imitate this attribute of God's abounding in steadfast love, first by loving God in return, and then by loving others. If we love God, we will obey his commandments, and so do what is pleasing to him. And if we love others, we invest ourselves in their well-being. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The fourth attribute of God listed in Jonah 4.3 is this one. God relents from sending disaster. Though we've worded it on your handout this way. God is not wanting any to perish. God wants lost people to be found and he looks for them to save them. In the book of Jonah, God doesn't want the Ninevites to perish. He doesn't want the sailors on board the ship to Tarshish to perish. And he certainly doesn't want Jonah, his prophet, to perish. When the New Testament talks about God not wanting people to perish, it's talking about us experiencing eternal death. So we are separated from all the blessings of God forever. The classic not perishing verse is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There's also Jesus saying to his followers in John 10, 28, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And then there's 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. We imitate God by not wanting others to perish. We imitate God's burden for lost people by bearing that burden ourselves. We want to help and see more and more people in our community become connected to Jesus Christ so God is glorified and lives are changed forever. To make more disciples, to be witnesses to the person and work of Jesus Christ, to proclaim the gospel without shame because we know it's the power of God for the salvation of all who will believe it. That's what God's people are about. Well, the last section on the bottom of your handout is my humble attempt at building a list. Building a list. Five action steps I can see coming out of the book of Jonah. And here's really a list to inspire your own list. We've spent the last 10 weeks studying Jonah, 10 weeks meeting God in his word. That's no little investment. You've been spending your time and your energy studying this book, and now you're asking the Lord, Lord, what's next? How is the book of Jonah meant to change my life? 
So I'll run through my list, and maybe you'll say, oh, yeah, there's one. Yeah, that probably should be in my list, too. So here we go. Building a list. Jonah chapter 5 is you. Remember, the book of Jonah is intentionally left, open-ended, ends with a question. I don't know how Jonah resolves all of his issues. And he's got issues. But that's okay, because I've got my issues, and the Lord is ultimately concerned with working on me and with me on my issues. So here we go, five different ways we might apply the book of Jonah. Number one, identify an area of disobedience and reverse course. It's a big theme in the book of Jonah. Jonah zigged when God was calling him to zag. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, and Jonah fled for Tarshish. And coming out of our study of Jonah, spend some concentrated time talking to God about where uh, you personally may be out of his will. Ask the Lord to identify an area in your own life, an area of disobedience, and then ask God to help you commit to reversing course. You can't do it apart from the help of God. You're going in the wrong direction, and you need to make a U-turn. The Lord would love to help you with that. And this church is here to help, with you, help you with that as well. On your handout, number two, Show compassion to the next needy person God puts in your path whom you can help. In Jonah chapter 4, the Lord is trying to lead Jonah to recognize his own lack of compassion and to love kindness. Loving kindness may be an area God wants to grow you. Commit yourself to the Lord. Lord, I will show kindness to the next person you put in my path whom I can help. Number three, for some of us, this issue of anger really hits home. Jonah had anger problems. God, I'm so angry, I want to die. Maybe you have your own anger problems. Your study of Jonah may be leading you to a place where you're ready to get serious about dealing with your anger. Get serious on your handout. Get serious about dealing with your anger. Because your anger is making a wreck of your relationships. And you know it in your soul that you are miserable with anger. And try as you might, you are losing. You have lost the battle with your anger. And so I want to encourage you. There are people who can help you with your anger problem. Let us help connect you with a person who can give you wise counsel. Someone who can give you uh, new tools, better tools in your tool belt to help you with your anger. Here's an action step to come out of today's study, right out of Jonah 4.3. Pick one of these virtues in Jonah 4.3. Pick an above virtue and throw yourself into imitating it. You can and you are meant to become a more gracious and merciful person. You can become more patient. You can see your love for others and for God increase. You can grow in your passion for lost people to meet Jesus and be saved. Pick one. Pick a card, any card. Pick an attribute, any attribute. And make that your prayer focus. Make that your action focus. Up until Christmas. From now to Christmas, I'm going to put my eye on the prize. I'm going to mark my target. I want to be more like Jesus, and I want to be more like Jesus in this particular way. Now the last action step on my list is really meant to be a summary of a running theme in the story of Jonah, the runaway prophet. In the book of Jonah, we meet a man who was running away from the will of God. We also meet a man who was frustrated because he couldn't run God. God wouldn't do Jonah's bidding and destroy the Ninevites. The Lord isn't looking for us to be a people who run away from him, and he's certainly not looking for people who can run him. When we attempt to run God, to control God, that's us putting ourselves in the place of God, and that's not going to work. 
So if running from God doesn't work and trying to run God is a non-starter, then what's left? Well, how about running toward God, into his presence and into his will? So now on your handout, we say the book of Jonah is asking us to come to grips with this reality. Come to grips with the reality you can't run God or run away from God. So what? So run toward him. I'm convinced if Jonah had been alive in New Testament times and Jonah had met Jesus during the public ministry of Jesus, I am sure this is what Jesus would have said to Jonah. And this morning, I believe it's what Jesus is saying to us. From the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I... Jesus will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my, for Jesus' yoke is easy, and Jesus' burden is light. Hey, let's keep running toward Jesus. Keep running toward Jesus, and you will find rest in Jesus Christ. All right, we're not done. You're going to be studying Jonah chapter 4 all this week. And then please, as uh, Elizabeth and El mentioned, please join us online later this week for a special Thanksgiving worship. There's testimonies that you have shared scripture, and I think it's about a half an hour of just focusing our minds on the goodness of God and why, I don't care what season we're in, we should be a thankful people. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray right now. Lord, I am so grateful for this Old Testament book of Jonah and the different ways you are meeting with us and teaching us out of this book. As we spend our last week working through our workbooks, meeting with our DNA groups, Help each of us to build our own list for putting into action the things you're showing us in your word. As we approach Thanksgiving, make us an even more grateful people so those around us will wonder and ask, why are you so grateful? And who are you so grateful to? And we can answer, we are grateful to the Lord, a God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. God, for you and your countless blessings, we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your great attention. Before I step down, I just want to invite those of you who are planning to be alone for Thanksgiving. Would you reach out to me? Would you reach out to your pastor? I want to connect with you personally. The Lord bless you and, and to thank you for your love for him and your love for Jesus Church, even this church, Paulsville Community Church. Thank you. You stand and join me today. How great the chasm then lay between us how high the mountains i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kind all through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living Lord Who could imagine so great a mercy could fathom such
such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven The King of kings calls me Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning of his resurrection. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave as no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to Celebrate God one last time. You guys are awesome. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Hey, that concludes our time today. I've gathered worship together. Can I encourage us all to gather our effects and pass through those doors uh, behind us where Gordy's standing? You can place anything from your worship packet, connect card, or offering tithes and gifts in the basket adjacent to the door. And please check in on starting Wednesday at noon. This week, the post will go up for the Thanksgiving service video. Engage with it. Use it to love God in your households. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.